Welcome or welcome back. Today I'm going to be talking about Fire from Heaven by Mary Minolt. Originally published in 1969, Fire from Heaven is the first in a historical fiction trilogy detailing the life and conquests of Alexander the Great. Here's the cover of my copy of Fire from Heaven. As we're going into this video, I want to give a spoiler warning. I'm going to be talking about spoilers, maybe not direct events that happen, but more so general themes and progressions in characters' relationships throughout the text. Additionally, I want to give a content trigger warning. We are going to be talking a little bit about war, violence, and attempted rape in this video. So if any of those things may trigger you, please stop the video now. Before we get started, I just want to give a quick shout out to my shirt. I don't know if you can see it super well, but I think it's pretty cool. It's basically like Grecian pottery design on it. Um, I think it's pretty sick and I thought it would be pretty fitting for this video as well. So before we dive into the text itself, I want to talk a little bit about the author. Born in 1905 in London, England, Mary Van Nolt went to the College of Oxford where she studied nursing and she actually worked as a nurse during World War II, which was the inspiration for a few of her novels. While working as a nurse, Renault met her life partner, Julie. After winning a prize for publishing, Mary and Julie moved to South Africa where they lived out the rest of their lives. While LGBT themes and characters are prevalent throughout Renault's work, and she was in a romantic and sexual relationship with a woman for the majority of her life. She was actually outspoken against the gay rights movement. Personally, I don't perceive Renault as blatantly homophobic. She's quoted as saying, She pictured human sexuality as a line along which people should be free to move as they choose. End quote. Regardless of her personal beliefs, Renault is considered to be a prominent force in depicting positive homosexual relationships at a time when there was virtually no mainstream representation. Now, let's dive into the book. So to begin with the plot and pacing of the story, reading an excerpt from the back cover, Fire from Heaven tells the story of Alexander's childhood when the young boy's defiant character was molded into the makings of a king. The story is a character study examined through the relationships which surround Alexander and depict his natural abilities, as well as what he learns in the first section of his life. The novel has a slower pace and remains consistent throughout. I personally didn't find a lot of peak moments or suspense or thrilling action. However, the text is very interesting throughout regardless. Next, to dive into the main characters presented in the story. Starting with Alexander, later known as Alexander the Great, Alexander is depicted as a brilliant and charismatic youth. Personally, I have found that people who often exhibit a lot of charisma aim to please everyone or most of the people around them, regardless of the impact internally. Alexander is not an exception to this. We see him consistently seeking love and approval from others. For him, this is mostly natural and effortless, but at times, specifically with his parents, he struggles to find a solution which will appease both parties. Next, going into Olympias, Alexander's mother. Olympias is a cunning woman who is married to Alexander's father at a really young age. She's described as having fiery red hair and a temperament to match. Alexander is the apple of her eye. He wins all of her love and confidence. Throughout the story, as Alexander begins to mark his place as the next in line to rule Macedon after his father, and Olympias begins to feel betrayed as she is no longer Alexander's sole confidant. Next, we're going to talk about King Philip, Alexander's father. Philip is a strong ruler and has expanded Macedon's borders and acquired power previously never achieved by what the southern Athenians would consider to be a northern barbarous people. Philip embodies toxic masculinity and spreads his toxicity throughout his family, making him disliked by Alexander and Olympias. Next, we're going to talk about Hephaestion. A boy the same age as Alexander, Hephaestion becomes fast friends with Alexander and admires him above all others, seeking to be his life partner. Alexander has a deep love and reliance on Hephaestion, who is his greatest confidant and comrade in all things. Lastly, we're going to talk about Aristotle. The great Athenian philosopher is brought to teach Alexander and the other young noblemen of Macedon. 
Under his tutelage, they learn a proper Athenian custom, study Homer, science, mathematics, and government. Now that we've established some of the main characters in the text, I want to talk about some of the prevalent themes that I found. So the first theme I want to talk about is Renault's illustration of Alexander's perfection. So on the first hand, we have a consistent allusion to Alexander's potential divinity. Throughout the text, he's compared to Achilles from Homer's Iliad, as well as being compared to Heracles in battle. So when we're analyzing both of these comparisons, these are two traits which would have been greatly valued, particularly in the time in which Alexander lived. But on the other hand, Alexander also shows that he's not a man of his time and constantly defies the expectations of others. In one scene after a battle, Alexander reflects with grief on the beauty of life which he destroyed through war. He's seen as extremely cleanly, which increases his physical beauty. He's an advocate for women, defending his mother and sister when their honor is questioned, as well as standing up for a widowed woman who is about to be raped by one of his comrades. Alexander is described as being gentle with animals and speaking with a high, clear voice. His musical talent is praised by his teacher, but mocked by his father for his open display of femininity. These second traits are things which we may find more appealing in a modern audience. Seemingly, Alexander is able to defy expectations of his time as well as of today, resulting in a description of a near-perfect individual. Secondly, I want to talk about the portrayal of love throughout the story. Soldiers, teachers, traveling artists, and actors all see Alexander's talent and beauty. There was even a passage in the book where a young woman who was the lover of one of Alexander's comrades comments, everyone loves Alexander because of his charisma. She notes that people are drawn to him, but she also observes that without this love and admiration, Alexander will die. In the text, this is presented as an omen or premonition, which fits into the idea of Alexander's seeking validation through others. To be clear, Alexander is not insecure, but rather simply someone who wants to please those around him. The second example of love that we see in the story is Alexander's mother. Her love is passionate, but also possessive and jealous. His mother believes she can be the only love in Alexander's life, and any positive attention he shows to others, in her mind, is a direct insult to her. Throughout the story, Alexander and Olympias' relationship changes drastically as he goes from complete devotion to her to becoming his own man in preparation for donning the role of King of Macedon. Alexander's father, Philip, also shows love and pride for Alexander, but it's a conditional love based on the accomplishments of Alexander. Therefore, Philip's love changes with the seasons. Alexander recognizes this in his father and eagerly awaits the upcoming conquest in Asia as a means to stay in his father's good graces. I think Philip's conditional basis for love is twofold. Firstly, there's a plot point throughout the text discussing and doubting Alexander's true lineage from Philip. Again, as he's described as almost divine, there's a potential that his father was a god. The reader is led to believe that Philip, sub on a subliminal level, understands that he's not really Alexander's biological father as well. The second condition that Philip shows is that he feels jealousy of the natural love and freedom of expression which Alexander so effortlessly wields. This is what Philip has spent his whole life accruing power to gain, and ultimately this jealousy is Philip's downfall, leading to his assassination by his own men. Lastly, we'll talk about Hephaestion's love, which is the most pure love depicted in Alexander's life. Their love for each other is remarked as being the purest love by many surveyors, including Aristotle. However, at times their relationship is unhealthy as well. Hephaestion leeches off of Alexander's radiance, while Alexander relies on Hephaestion to unburden all of his demons, leading to a symbiotic relationship. Hephaestion loves and desires Alexander in a sexual way. While Alexander may consent, he's never the initiator and seemingly not as into it sexually as Hephaestion is. While the boys are the same age, which is another unusual aspect of their relationship during this time, Alexander is in many ways described as being quite naive, so at times the nature of their relationship led me personally to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Next, let's transition into the good elements of the story. Firstly, I really like this kind of historical fiction. 
I felt like I was learning something as I was reading. I felt like it was educational and it didn't just feel like a fluff piece that I would forget about in a week and kind of never be able to use in another conversation. Secondly, the story was really beautiful and the writing was also very beautiful. Renault writes in my mind in a kind of poetic way. By no means was the story written as poetry, it's certainly prose. However, she gives such beautiful descriptions that at times it feels more like you're reading a poem. It's really beautifully done and very detailed. And lastly, I think it's really important to queer history, which I think this text does a really good job of doing. And what I mean by that is sometimes when teaching history, especially in schools, there's a tendency to erase. So whether this is done when talking about ancient times and Achilles and Patroclus, whether this is done when talking about Alexander the Great, or whether this is done in more recent context in regards to the Turing test. I think it's incredibly important that these stories and renditions of queer history remain alive and shared so that so people understand queer people have always existed and they've also thrived and been some of the most important and influential people in our Earth's history. And on that note, I want to talk about some of the more bad or negative elements of the story in my opinion. So firstly, while the text is non-fiction, it at times feels fictional. So in my opinion, I actually prefer this approach. I think it made it, it made the story feel more lifelike. It made it a little bit more accessible and enjoyable for me. However, this is something that Renault was actually criticized for in her writing. And I have to agree. I think the depiction of Alexander as this near perfect human simply wasn't possible. And while it was very beautiful to read, and I certainly didn't mind it in that aspect, if you are looking for a uber realistic depiction, this may not be the best choice. Secondly, when we're talking about texts which deal in the ancient world, sometimes the writing can be a little bit inaccessible just by the nature of the content at hand. So this is mainly depicted in people's names as well as place names. And while the writing is extremely beautiful, it also felt scholarly and at times inaccessible on that nature due to the diction used by Reynolds. Lastly, I'd have to say the pacing. There weren't a ton of highs and lows like I said earlier. And because of this, it took a little time to fully get immersed in the story. I found it interesting the whole time and I really enjoyed all the aspects that Reynolds presented but it wasn't like an epic, epic story or an epic love story even. Definitely feels more like a slightly fictionalized biography. Overall, I actually really liked the book. I feel after finishing it, I have a much better understanding of Alexander the Great, who he potentially was, and certainly the society in which he lived. I think if you like books like Call Me By Your Name, which has a very poetic feel, if you liked Song of Achilles, which is dealing with this kind of ancient culture of ancient Greece, has a lot of the same references, same type of characters, and you enjoy that historical feel, I think you would really like this type of book. In an effort to tie together the themes of this story, I actually completed a piece which, in my mind, I was creating for a movie poster or an alternative book poster. So I'm going to be sharing that now. Have you read this book? What did you think? Have you read anything else by Mary Reynolds? Let me know. She has quite a few books out there and some of them seem pretty interesting. So definitely leave me any recommendations by her or recommendations for other titles that you've really enjoyed or you think I might enjoy. I'd love to check those out. Overall, I hope you enjoyed my review and thanks for watching.